I was thinking about a story that goes with business, relationship, and spiritual connections that happened uh, this week, actually. I met with a guy who is, uh, he's come a couple of times to Marketplace Connections. He has got some business-related questions, and I was able to connect him with somebody who works with small businesses to take their business to the next level. So we had a good discussion about business. And then we went from there to talk about our friendship. I've known him for probably seven or eight years or so. And then we easily went to the spiritual part. He had some spiritual challenges in his life. So it was really fun just to meet with him for an hour. And I thought, you know, those three things continue to emerge in the process. So that's really the heart of who we are and what we do. And uh, that's, that's the flavor of Marketplace Connections, I guess I'd put it that way. Cheryl Cuthbertson is becoming a good friend. I got to hang out with her a couple of days ago in Silverton, Silverton, Silverdale. <laughs> we live in Edmonds now, so I got on the ferry in Edmonds, took a half an hour ride to Kingston. Uh, she picked me up. We went to a meeting for a couple of hours because Marketplace Connections is in the process of partnering with Children of the Nations to try to take entrepreneurial leadership to the country of Malawi. So we spent two hours with a very good meeting on figuring out how we can work together. So I'm really looking forward to our partnership. Cheryl has had quite a background. If you go to her LinkedIn page, it has a list of fascinating things that she has done. She has worked in corporate America, including Microsoft Alliance, was it? Mm-hmm. So she's had quite a diverse background experience. She's now the Director of Sustainability at Children of the Nations. And we particularly like this organization because our son-in-law works half-time for Children of the Nations. And our daughter and son-in-law and three kids were in Malawi for a couple of months this summer. And I'm hoping that uh, Pat and I might be able to get to do one of these trips next year in our partnership. So I'm excited about what you have to share, Cheryl. So come on up and take it from there. I'm so excited that we have such a diverse group of people here today because the conversation just makes it that much richer. So as we talked about what is poverty, and that, I'm glad you asked that question. That was a great question. Um, I'm from inner city New York, and so certain level of poverty there. Um, and then I worked for a very long time. I've worked in corporate America for over 20 years. Um, my last corporate gig was at Starbucks right here at their headquarters office where I managed um, about 600, uh, the, all the Barnes and Noble stores, you know, whenever you go in Barnes and Noble and you have coffee. So that I managed all of those and I managed all the college and university stores. And so left there and went into the um, nonprofit world and got to work in the inner city and got to see poverty there. And that was eye opening for me here in our own country to see the level of poverty, to actually know that there are children who have no electricity, um, going to knock on kids' doors to get them into school. And, uh, you know, there's 18 people living in the house, no electricity, no running water, right here in the United States, right here in Washington State. Um, to see sex trafficking going on right here in Washington State and understanding how some of that comes out of poverty. But I have to tell you that um, the biggest experience in my life is when I went to Sub-Saharan Africa and to West Africa, and poverty took on a whole new meaning for me because there wasn't even an opportunity for electricity. It's not that we can't afford electricity, there is no electricity. And people still living in the dark and people still not having running water and people sitting in the dirt. Um, the most profound experience for me on all of my trips to Africa, and let me tell you, there have been some very profound moments, um, was we always go to one of our ministry sites, and I'll tell you a little bit about that quickly, about Children of the Nations, and we take a child from one of our schools and we go, we have to go into the market. And our CEO, Chris Clark, makes us go in the market, buy a live chicken, kill it, and give it to this child to take home to his family. And when he told me that before I joined Children of the Nations, I said, Chris, I'm, I, I'm from New York. I know nothing about killing a chicken. And he said, but we want you to experience exactly what our kids go through. It's the only way you really get to understand what's going on. So we go to the market, we get our chicken, drive home with the live chicken fluck, clucking around in the back of the truck and um, rice and lentils and beans and 
give it to this young man and he takes it home to his mom and we walk with him into the bush. Um, so we're not in any cities, I'm not in Nairobi, I'm literally out in the bush. And we go in the bush with this young man to meet his mother and she speaks no English, she speaks um, the Ugandan local language and we sit and she offers us a seat in the dirt because there's no furniture, there's no furniture, she lives in a mud hut and we offer banana and we sit there together and we talk and the most profound thing for me was that this woman asked me if she could pray for me. She said, I, I need to pray for you. And um, tears, I mean, you just can't handle that moment when this woman who is probably my age but looks like she is my grandmother's age because she's been through so much, who has eight other children raising them by herself, living in a mud hut, all of them in one room, and no furniture, no nothing, and she gave her heart out to me. Um, profound moments like that really make you understand that poverty is not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing, it's of the spirit, right? It's a mindset, because that woman in no way thought that she was poor. So we look at poverty from a material perspective, but what we don't understand is that it, poverty is really not about material wealth. And so when you go to Africa, and when you go to countries where there is extreme poverty, we have to look at it with a different lens. And we're going to talk about some of that today. So Children of the Nations, really quickly, um, our mantra is raising children who transform nations. We've been around for 20 years and had the opportunity to raise children from birth um, all the way up to now we have young people graduating from college. And our organization goes after the worst of the worst of the worst. So in Uganda, we went after the, um, the, the war in Uganda with the Liberation Army there and children were left orphaned with nowhere to go living in refugee camps. We went in and started a ministry site in those areas. Um, in Sierra Leone 20 years ago when they had their civil war, that's when Chris Clark, our CEO, decided he was going to go to Sierra Leone and pick these children up out of the circumstances they were in and start um, raising them in a family. And so now we have thousands of children that we raise in Sierra Leone, and many of them who were homeless refugees living on the street are now graduating college. And it's amazing. We have young, one young man here with us right now from Malawi who just graduated from college. Um, his name is Francisco. And both of his parents died of HIV when he was 10. And Children of the Nations took him in, raised him, and now he's a new entrepreneur and business person. So that's what we're going to talk about. How does this thing about poverty end up getting linked into business and global business development? So where do I click? Right. The uh, right one? Get that arrow on the right. Uh, that one. Okay, there we go. Yep. Mm -hmm. So raising children, we have 13 village partnerships, five countries. We're in Uganda, Malawi, um, Sierra Leone. We're actually in six countries. We're just going into Liberia, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. What we do is we provide food, education, social support for, now that number is close to um, 4,000 children. We have children, some children in our full care, but most of the time what we want to do is keep children with their families, and so we do what we call village partnership programs. In 2015, 71 of our students completed high school and 105 students are now in university. And this is an amazing number because these are 105 kids that probably would not be alive today, but they are in university and that is amazing. The question we have now is what do we do with them? Because these young people graduate from college and they're going back into economies that are corrupt, that have no money, that have no industry, that have no marketplace. So now our big question in my job with Children of the Nations is, we have to create a marketplace economy for these young people that are growing up in these countries. So just a little bit about the numbers behind our work. We feed about 4,000 children a day. We assist 10,000 medically and 4,000 kids are in our schools. And this number is so high, people ask about this number, because in the Dominican Republic we actually have a hospital that we've built where doctors from here go over there and do major surgeries throughout the year. And that's why we serve about 10,000 people in the Dominican Republic. So a little bit about me, what I do at Children of the Nation. So this first picture, I work with the young people there. My job is to make sure these girls have all graduated college again, these are the kids that you used to see on the TV who were 
wearing the tattered clothes, you know, in the street, begging for food. And these young women, they're dressed up because this young lady just got married in the light blue in the back, and these were her, they call them maid, maidens of honor. That was a huge thing for her, because for a young woman in Africa to get married at the age after she's graduated college is huge, where they usually get married at the age of 12. 12 years old. And the other thing that happens to young women in Africa is they go through an initiation process with different men in the village before they can get married. And the things that go on and the things that you've heard are actually true. I mean, these are actually things that happen. So when we have a group of young girls who are waiting to get married, um, have made it through that process. We are so proud of them and they're in university and our job is to help them continue to move on, transform their lives, transform their village, and then transform the nation that they live in. So that's part of my job. The other part of my job is I look at agriculture, water, renewable energy, and microfinance programs in each of our countries because we do not want countries to be dependent. We don't want to be a relief organization that says, here, we're shipping food. We're d and we used to ship food. We had to because we had emergency situations. When Ebola hit in Sierra Leone, we had to ship thousands and thousands of pounds of food to Sierra Leone. And last but not least, the best part of my job is I get to work with little guys like this. This is Mikey when I was in Malawi. Mikey weighed um, not even a pound when he was born. His mother died of HIV. His father was dying of HIV and came to us and begged us to take Mikey. And we said, we just, you know, babies are so hard for us to take care of. And he said, please, please, please take my son. We did, and look at Mikey today. And that was just this summer when we were there. So that's the smile, is, that's the best part of my job, is in the middle of everything else, I get to do that. So let's talk a little bit about um, what's happening in Africa and other countries. And when I say Africa, I'm talking all third world countries. So we talk about the social issues, and I can sit here and tell you all day about the poverty that's there. But I challenge you to think that the social issues in Africa have changed. 2.6 billion people have gained access to improved drinking water in the last 10 years. 2.6 billion people because organizations and businesses have made that a priority. HIV infections are down by 40 percent. That is huge. That is huge. The other that is down significantly, I think by 38 percent, is malaria. And I'll tell you an interesting story about a mosquito net project that we're doing in Malawi. More kids are in primary school than ever before. Here's an interesting story. In Malawi, we go, we have these three and four year olds and they come up to us and they speak very loud because they want, they're, they want to, they're proud of what they've learned. Well, not only do these three year olds speak Chichewa, but they speak fluent English and they read and write in English. And they've been on the national news because it's unheard of that children at that age are bilingual. Our kids here at three years old are not bilingual. They're bilingual. So I'm telling you that because we're starting to see that education in other countries is really what is the catalyst for economic growth in these countries. These little ones who are speaking English are learning at a rate faster than anything you'd ever believe. And they were just showing off for us with flashcards, three years old, you know, re giving us numbers and they yell, they go five and four and you know, and we're just like, okay, you know, it's great. But we, it, it was just amazing to see the good things that are happening. So what if I also told you that GDP has risen by 4.9% since 2008 in Africa? People don't think about that number. Telecommunications, banking, retail are flourishing in Africa. Construction is booming in Africa. Private investment inflows are surging in Africa. Why don't we hear about that? Because there are a lot of companies that are going over to do business in Africa because they recognize that is the next marketplace. It is the next marketplace. It is the untapped area in the world and nobody's going to blast that in the news and say, hey, come one, come all to Africa. But let me tell you, Africa is fertile soil for investment, for business, for banking, for construction. It is fertile soil. As a matter of fact, it is almost the only place left in the world that has been untouched and unreached by the business community. 
So why are we talking about business in Africa? 50% of the young people in Africa, these are new consumers, think about it, because Generation X, I think we're in X now, are we in Y? Um, they're new consumers. 50% of the young people in this world live in Africa. 50%. And in Africa, 70% of the people in Africa are under the age of 30. 70% of everybody on the continent of Africa is under the age of 30. We have a whole new generation of consumers popping up on the, on the continent of Africa that are prime for business. 70%. And that's because health issues are improving, because of things like HIV improving, malaria improving. So now you have young people that are living longer. The, the average life expectancy in Africa used to be maybe 50. If you lived to 50, you were old. You were doing well. Now people are living longer. And so we have a lot more young people in that consumer market. 80% of major technology companies now have a home in Africa. Microsoft, huge in Africa. Verizon, AT&T, all of them, huge in Africa. There are global summits, technology and telecommunication summits that Microsoft, Nokia, AT&T, Nextel are hosting, not here, but in Africa every year. And I, because I used to be in the technology industry, I get all the invites to these major conferences and I kept going, why is everything in South Africa and Africa? Because that is the next marketplace. Other countries have an increasing large infrastructure investment in Africa. China is one that has a large infrastructure investment in Africa. When I went to Malawi, I drove into Malawi airport at night. And remember, Africa is still very dark, no electricity anywhere. And I get close to our ministry site and looming in the middle of the night is this well-lit building that looked like Seahawk Stadium. It was a brand new soccer stadium in the poorest country in the world. Malawi is the poorest country in the world. And they had a brand new soccer stadium, totally lit up, right? Now I'm saying, well, how did electricity get here? But it's not over here, you know? So you ask people, oh, you guys must have a soccer team. No. Do you guys play soccer? We want to. Okay. Then the next day in the daylight as I'm driving around the soccer field, I see housing starting to pop up right across the street. Countries are moving into Africa because it is the next place for business. So what's changing in Africa's economy? It is the world's most rapidly growing region. It is the world's most rapidly growing region. If you think about it, here in the United States, we're pretty tapped out, right? I mean, we, we are just maxed out on everything that we can do here. But in Africa, you have people who have still never seen half of the products and services that we produce here in the United States. So for those of you that have businesses, when you think about going into a region where there's a level playing field and open consumers, Africa is one of those places. There's a lot of reduction in civil unrest. Now we think about, we hear what the news, what the media tells us, and I will just tell you all, don't listen to what MSNBC and CNN tell you about what happens around the world. Get on a plane and travel yourself. Yeah, we have issues with ISIS. Yes, we have issues with Boko Haram. But that is a small part of what is happening on the continent of Africa and in the Middle East. And those of you who travel know, in Dubai, in the Middle East, in different countries, there is a lot of very productive things going on and you have to go and see it for yourself. When I got on the plane to go to Uganda, I could not believe all of the humanitarian organizations that packed that plane. Everybody on that plane, it had to be 90% filled with humanitarian effort, but we don't hear that on MSNBC and CNN. What we hear is about you know, the unrest in a couple of little pockets and it causes people to stay away. People say, oh, I don't want to go to Africa because Boko Haram is there. And Well, let me tell you, there are a lot of places like Malawi that has never had civil unrest ever. And it is a booming population. Economic policy reversals. Right now, the UN, UNICEF, um, World Health Organization are putting policies in place to energize the markets in Africa, policies that were never there before. So what's the opportunity for US businesses? 
you have the opportunity to develop a local customer base via mobile access. And the reason I say via mobile access is everybody in Africa has a cell phone. Everybody, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how poor you are, doesn't matter if you have electricity or not, everybody has a cell phone. Every single person. Children, mommies, daddies, everybody has a cell phone. And what they do, whenever they do have money, they can go pay for minutes to put onto their phone. But you will never see anybody in Africa without a cell phone in their hand, in their pocket, in their purse. And the funniest thing is when you have a conference or something and you um, have outlets like this, the first thing people do is run in and plug their phones in. So all the outlets in every building are just, it's, it's just hysterical. So there's an opportunity here to touch that consumer base without going. Without going there, there's an opportunity to communicate. One of the best programs that's come up economically in Jamaica and in Africa is what they call the M-Pesa program, M-Pesa. It's mobile money. It's like Western Union on steroids. So now you here can send money to somebody's phone in Africa and they can then take that phone and go buy groceries. They, money never has to exchange hands. And it is one of the best things that's ever happened in third world countries. And so if you have a business here that's looking to do business in Africa, that has, is making it a lot easier. There's a lot of low barriers to entry in new markets. If you're trying to do a construction business in um, Africa, you don't have a lot of competition. Also, they give you a lot of incentives to come and do business in those countries. The replication of already established products and services. Again, the things that we have here that they don't have in third world countries it's an opportunity. You don't have to reinvent something new. You don't have to come up with the next new idea. The ideas that we have here are brand new in Africa. So that opens up a whole new economy to go after. So what's the challenge? The challenge is that the young people I'm talking about that we have finally gotten into college are coming up from extreme poverty and coming into a world where there is major corruption and they are having a hard time figuring out how do we break through. It's interesting to watch a young person who's graduated from college who now the lights have gone on and they go, oh my goodness, the things that have been happening to the people in my country, this is horrific. When you educate a child, now all of a sudden they're asking questions. Now they're starting to challenge the government. So how do we raise this next generation of leaders, not only in their country, but in our country, that are going to challenge the status quo? And, and giving them a voice to figure out how to do that is really, really tough. Lots of national corruption historically in Africa. Governments are corrupt. They, the money goes into the government's hand. It does not make it to the people. One of the best things that happened when we were in Uganda, the president had been in power for 30 years, 20 years. His wife had been a member of parliament for 12 years. She stepped down while we were there. She said, we have got to pass the baton to some new leaders. We cannot, and 16 other members of parliament resigned with her in one year this year, 16, best thing that could have ever happened for Uganda, because that opens up for 16 college educated new young leaders to come in and take over. We have to embrace diversity, we have to be able to collaborate, and we have to reflect a character that embraces this new marketplace. We cannot do what we did 20, 30, and 40 years ago. One, we can't go in with Western ideas that we're going to take over. And two, we have to be able to ask the question of how do we help without hurting? And some of you may have read the book, When Helping Hurts. How do we not do this and do a relief thing and not do a sustainable piece? How do we shift from just delivering food and sending boxes and boxes of food to being able to teach somebody how to farm their own land? How do we move from even drilling wells? We thought we were doing something as COT and oh, we're drilling wells in all these communities. We were getting charged $10,000 to drill a well until we ran into an ethical businessman who said, we can do this for $2,500.
you're th- th- this is a new way of extorting money out of poor people. Another thing we're looking at is this, when I told you about malaria, mosquito nets, everybody in Africa has to have a mosquito net because of malaria. So when you go as a visitor, you have to be on a mosquito net. We pay $11 for a mosquito net, $11. So we said, you know, that seems really high for a mosquito net that really is ripping up in a week. So we investigated and find out all of the mosquito nets, none of them are made in Africa. So we found the raw materials to be able to make the mosquito nets. And now we have women in our villages making and dipping mosquito nets and selling them as a business. They are one of the only groups anywhere in Africa doing that. And um, not UNICEF, but USAID is amazed and going, how'd you guys do that? It's really simple. It's a mosquito net. You, You sew it up. You put a drawstring on it. We taught the women how to dip in insecticide. And we can also sell it for about $4. So who's selling it to us? And when we buy it in the retail markets in town for 11, people are exploiting poverty. They're exploiting poor people. So these young people are dealing with all that because they're starting to see it. And we're teaching them. And they're going, how do we come up against this? So then we have to say, so what's the solution? The U.S. marketplace needs to expand to be able to leverage with and, and be able to do business without geographic boundaries. That's one thing. We have to realize that when we say the marketplace, and I love the name of John's organization, Marketplace Connections, because the marketplace is no longer Bellevue. It's not Washington. It's not the United States. It is the global market. It is global marketplace connections. And truly, as businesses, we have to look beyond what we see right in front of us and look at what we're looking at on a global perspective. New investments need to be in education, technology, and infrastructure in those countries. We need to not just invest in relief, but we need to invest in education, technology, and infrastructure. This is where we need to be investing, especially in Africa. If you're a successful business here or in Africa, We're moving away from just hiring based on productivity of a person and looking at their versatility and their creativity. How creative can you be? How innovative can you be? How versatile can you be? As I sit in this room and I think about all the different languages and the people and the cultures and the customs, versatility is key in establishing yourself in any marketplace. You no longer can go in with your view of the world and say, this is the Western way of doing things, and dag on it, we're going to do it our way, and we're going to teach these people how to, no, wrong. When we went in even to teach agriculture, and we were teaching uh, young people how to be goat farmers, and I said to my staff, I said, you know, I kind of think if we're coming from Silverdale, Washington, going to Africa, to teach them how to be goat farmers. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with that statement? Now what we can teach is how to do a new drip irrigation system that they can make out of buckets and tubing and we're doing that and then let them do it on their own. What we can do is show them how the, the when we process our sunflower, the remainder of that we're able to use to feed the goats and it makes the goats healthier and bigger and we can teach that but I can't teach somebody in Africa how to farm. They were born farming. What we have to do is teach innovation and how we can apply versatility, creativity to what they're already doing, but not to go over and teach people what they already know. On both continents, we need to develop these next generation leaders. It's just key. And this is just a chart I threw in because it's something that we focus on at COTN. We're moving from intervention, which is where a lot of agencies are in doing the temporary solutions. Yes, sometimes you have to do crisis response, to looking at programs where we do measurable outcomes, meeting daily needs, looking at a village, and you have about a one to three year impact. And ultimately, our goal is total sustainability, where you're looking at knowledge transfer. It's intergenerational, and it has a lifelong impact. This is what it means to raise generational leaders. And guess what? This is not just important in Africa. This is important here. We need to be teaching our young people here who are going into business how to be sustainable and not look at quick fixes all the time and and hanging out down here in the intervention. You want a successful business? 
this is where you need to be. Most people don't start a business to be in it for a year unless you're just trying to flip a business for money. So let's see, next generation leaders. They've been deeply invested in at least two generations, meaning they have their foot in this thing going, innovation, I see the light, but yet they're still back here trying to bring people up from behind them. There's, there's terms we use like each one teach one or Sankofa, which is a Ghanaian term, which means turn, go back and grab somebody and bring them along with you. And that's what we teach our next generation leaders. They're challenged to how do they use their resources to then improve the health and economic infrastructure of their previous generation. And this is really key. When we do, we finance businesses for our young people when they get out of college. But they have to do a business that is going to give back to their village. We will not finance them to do something that's self-serving only. So if they say, well, I want you to give me money because I'm gonna move over here and I'm gonna start a technology company, no. If, you, if we're funding it, then it's gotta be something sustainable that's going to improve your village. And so that's key in what we look at. The other thing about next-gen leaders, we teach them to be invested in what we call the theory of collectives and inclusion, and I'll just run through that really quick. Um, and they're on the cutting edge of technology and innovation. Young leaders, young Africans in um, Malawi, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Liberia, they are on social networking and the internet like nobody's business. So they see now what's going on around the world, and they're challenged to use that social media to improve their environment. And we teach them ethical practices that break all these constraints of corruption. The big problem they're having is how do they get into the government so that they can start breaking down some of those patterns that have been there for so long. So when we talk about collectives, we talk about disrupting corruption, accelerating advocacy and influence. When people come together collectively, when women like this are farming with, with other people and they have a collective voice, they have much more opportunity to disrupt corruption. And then also they're able to work on economies of scale. So we teach them theories of collectives. We encourage diversity of ideas and skills because that way, if you're growing tomatoes and cucumber and cabbage and somebody over here is doing goat farming, how do you pull that together to make a marketplace that serves the entire community? We look at the theory of inclusion um, something you all know, value chain economics is huge, intergenerational conversations is very important, and increasing diversity of solutions and resources. Value chain economics is the one big thing, too, that's keeping people in Africa um, held hostage because they're very interested in, let me feed myself today right here, rather than looking at how do I take what I've grown and sell it to somebody else. So we've taught people in Malawi how to go sell in Zambia. So we have a 350 acre farm in Malawi where we do bananas and cabbage and you know more bananas than you could ever do to feed our children. So we go, we're also seven kilometers from Zambia. So we take our food, go into the marketplace in Zambia and sell there. So it's all about value chain. It can't just be grow for yourself, but how do you move those markets forward? Two minutes, Cheryl. Okay, and I think I'm just about done. Um, how will U.S. businesses respond, invest and build on ethics and character? It's key. Fuel collaboration with innovation and technology, um, holistic solutions to social problems. We can't forget corporate social responsibility. One of the big things I learned at Starbucks, um, it's huge. Thank you.